You're listening to the Common Fan Podcast, a Husker football podcast for the common fan by the common fan. Welcome back to the Common Fan Podcast. You know, guys, the Super Bowl is coming up. Valentine's Day is coming up. Heck, it's almost dinner time. Certified Piedmontese beef is right for any occasion. You could be making burgers while you drink that off-season Husker Kool-Aid. And of course, while you're listening to the Common Fan Podcast. Or maybe you're grilling up some steaks while you wine and dine that special someone. Certified Piedmontese has got you covered. Make sure to get all your favorite certified Piedmontese beef products for any occasion at your local Mercado butcher shop or visit cpbeef.com for delivery to all 50 states. Certified Piedmontese beef, fueling the Husker football team and fueling the Common Fan podcast. Fellow Common fans, I am TJ Burkle, as always, alongside Matty Owens, Sr. and Geoff in Lincoln. Gentlemen, Today, we have the high honor of being joined by the most distinguished guest, uh, by some degree, to have graced the airwaves of the Common Fan Podcast. He served as our nation's 24th Secretary of Defense from 2013 to 2015, and in so doing, became the first enlisted combat veteran to serve as Defense Secretary. He was a U.S. Senator representing Nebraska, serving two terms from 1997 to 2009, Before his distinguished career in high public office, well, we don't have time to read the whole bio because it's extremely impressive and very long, but among other things, he was a decorated soldier in Vietnam, earning two Purple Hearts as an infantry squad leader. He was Deputy Secretary of Veterans Affairs in the Reagan administration. He founded one of the nation's first cell phone companies, and he served as president of the USO, the United Service Organization for our men and women in uniform and their families. His is an unmatched American success story. We are, of course, talking about the Honorable Chuck Hagel. Secretary Hagel, it is truly an honor and a privilege to have you join the Common Fans today. Well, it's my honor, TJ and uh, Matt and Jeff. I appreciate it very much. Uh, What you didn't note uh, uh, in your generous introduction to me, TJ, is that you and I work together in Washington in the United States Senate. Yes, sir. uh, I've never recovered. (laughs) (laughs) None of us have, sir. None of us have. (laughs) Well, that's I had the the high honor of serving on the uh, Senator Hagel staff for just over three years in Washington, D.C. And uh, in all seriousness, it is a true highlight of my career. I'm not so sure it's a highlight of uh, the senator's uh, career, but uh, but I'm very thankful for uh, for that experience and that opportunity. Um. So, sir, I'd love to, speaking of your time in the Senate, you know, it's it's hard to believe, but it's been since 2002, since your name last appeared on a statewide ballot in Nebraska. So there are literally common fan listeners who can legally uh, walk into a bar and order a drink who were not alive the last time you ran for the U.S. Senate. Um, so for maybe some of our younger listeners out there, um, can, we'd love to just, you know, have you go over your 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 story about your upbringing? I know you grew up over a number of Nebraska towns. You moved around a lot, but all of it within Nebraska. And just kind of would love to hear about that story and what that was like. Well, uh, uh, thank you. Uh, I did grow up in a number of towns. Uh, we lived in seven different towns, most all of them in western Nebraska, before I graduated from high school in uh, Columbus at Columbus St. Bonaventure, but uh, each uh, each town we lived in was an experience. Uh, you know, you developed uh, friends and uh, different uh, different things that you saw that really shaped you. Like you guys, like everybody on the podcast, you, you know, you're shaped by your environment and your upbringing and your parents, uh, those you associated with, and what you saw. Uh, I was blessed, I think, with with uh, really a remarkable upbringing in that regard. Now, when my brothers and I, I'm the oldest of four boys, every time we'd move, uh, we thought it was the end of the world. Uh, We would find no new friends. We were leaving old friends behind. But every time we moved to, it got better. 
and you know it, it just helped you develop at least i thought it did and i think my brothers feel the same way and then uh, a great experience at st bonds uh, you know, i played football uh, um, Devaney and Osborne uh, did not recruit me. Uh, Tom Osborne used to say uh, in our Nebraska breakfast when he was back as a house member, it was a standing joke. He would say, yeah, we, Bob and I took a look at Chuck uh, in his senior year. He was, a, he was, he was quite a guy. Uh, one thing we can say about him, uh, he wasn't very big, uh, but he sure was slow. <laughs> 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 so at least, he re- he, at least he remembered you you must have left an impression well i i did uh, of course <laughs> but um but you know like we all as we were all brought up in and different towns different ways different schools you know we're a product of that as i said and um for me it was it was great because we played football we had good football teams in those days matter of fact the, the year after i left the uh, they won the St. Bonds won the Class B uh, state championship, and we were I think seven one and one my senior year. The year before we were seven one and one, so we had really good teams with good coaches, and I learned a lot. I I, I received a football scholarship to Wayne State uh, in Nebraska. I got hurt, and I had a, a pinched nerve, and I had to have an operation. Then I transferred to Kearney and played there, but I got hurt again. But then I wrestled there for a year at uh, then Kearney State and so uh, really uh, athletics have been a a key part of my upbringing and and, uh, my my younger years and it helped me it really did Uh, teamwork development pushing yourself coaches you don't realize it uh, then but the older you get the the more you, you recognize it and the more you're grateful for that experience well, yeah, and, and sir, I imagine, you know, as much as you moved around uh, throughout the state, you know, s- sports is a fantastic way to get to know more more kids um, and kind of develop some buddies. And, you know, you move around and it's hard to make friends. But if you're playing sports and you're an athlete, that, I imagine that's a little bit easier. Um, so and we know that through TJ – uh, that you're quite a football player at St. Bonaventure in Columbus, now known as, as Columbus SCOTUS, of course. But yeah. any any more that you'd like to share with us about your days on the gridiron? <laughs> well, I remember maybe the highlight of my St. Bonaventure years, my, my freshman year, we lived in York, and I went to York St. Joseph. And um, they don't have a high school anymore, but they played eight-man football, which was very interesting. So uh, that, that was – my introduction to kind of big time football. And then we moved to Columbus where I graduated uh, from St. Bonaventure. So when I was a sophomore, uh, I was a a second team fullback and defensive back. Uh, And uh, in the second game uh, of the year, the uh, starting defensive halfback allowed two touchdowns to go over his head. And the coach was not happy with him. So he put me in. Hagel, get in. Get in. Well, I, I got in. I knew they would pick on me right away, and they did. And, of course, they throw a pass uh, to who I was I was guarding. And uh, not a touchdown, but a, a long reception. And I knew they'd come right back at me. But the tricky fellow that I was, actually, he was very lucky, uh, I intercepted the pass, ran it all the way back for a touchdown, 65 yards, Intercept yes. touchdown. <laughs> well, that was a highlight. I mean, for me, I was, and we won the game by, I think, a touchdown. So after the game, then, then I, then I was a starter from then on. But I, I suppose of all the, the great experiences I had, that was the one thing that stands out because that gave me so much confidence, and it, it just really changed me in ways that I, I couldn't. I couldn't um, recognize at the time, but now I look back on it and I, I understand it a, a lot more. But that was, I mean, I had a pretty good, I had a pretty good run at St. Bonaventure in football, but that was the one thing that really stands out in my mind. That's awesome. That's awesome that it gave you that confidence. I mean, yeah. and in high school, I think I was 95 pounds and I played football. 
Um, <laughs> so I lost all of my confidence playing football <laughs> for PSX when I was a freshman. So I'm glad that you got to experience that, Mr. Secretary. <laughs> Sir, I was was da David City Aquinas would have been one of your kind of rivals at at Columbus St. Bonds, right? Yeah, it was the big rival. Okay. And that was the one. It was kind of like the old Nebraska days, Oklahoma and Nebraska. You know, the Big Eight championship always came down to Nebraska, Oklahoma. Who was going to the Orange Bowl? That was determined by that game. And then, if you remember, one year Nebraska and Oklahoma played each other in the Orange Bowl. But, uh, but yeah, David City was the big one. When we played him when I was a senior, we lost six to nothing. And oh, it, it just <laughs> at David City, and I think I think we were ranked number four in the state, and they were ranked second or first, I think. But uh, we should have beat them. And uh, there's a big picture. It was a big picture in the Omaha World Herald and the Columbus papers of, of me, a defensive back, being the last guy to, uh, to Grubaugh, Rick Grubaugh, who was very good. He was, was all state and fast, very fast. And me lunging at him, but missing him. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and he went on to score. So, oh, uh, yeah, that's, that was that's, the picture. Uh, my my dad was a David C. Aquinas guy, as you know. Uh, he, was, he was a couple yeah. couple grades younger than you, but um, uh, those those are the ones you think about. You know, so you'll be laying in bed or you'll be at the yeah. grill or something, and th 20, 30 years later, those are the ones you still <laughs> still think about. Those games you think you should have won, right? Yeah, well, I know. I mean, sir, how did I not catch him? But anyway, that's <laughs> that's the way it is. Well, sir, so we've actually been in touch with uh, with Columbus Scotus uh with the athletic department there and uh, they were kind enough to share uh, a couple of pictures with us here i'm, I'm going to share my screen and uh, see if you can oh. see this can you see yeah. that on your screen yeah yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. all right so for the common fans listening to the audio version of the podcast make sure to check out the youtube so you can see the picture but we've got uh, the uh, the starting lineup here uh, uh, with uh, the future Secretary of Defense number three in the backfield, clear as that's clear as day. That's Chuck Hagel there, sir. Uh, do you remember taking this picture? Oh, I do. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. No, I remember, and that was the, the, the photo day. And, and for seniors, they took individual pictures as well. Maybe you've got it. I don't know, but um, so they're all pretty standard pictures of each of us individually. But uh, I start joking around, and I took the, the Heisman uh, pose. Yes. <laughs> and, and the coach had said, Hagel, stop that. <laughs> well, the coaches turned their back, and I took the Heisman pose, and the photographer got it. So in the yearbook, it's me in the Heisman pose. Excellent. <laughs> awesome. Beautiful. Oh, that's fantastic. Well, we don't have that one. I do have one more I'd like to share with you. It's not uh, not exactly football related, but I do think it will be of, of interest uh, to you and to all common fans. Bear with me a moment. Uh, uh, you know, we're not known as a the technically advanced podcast here, but let's see. Uh, <laughs> let me hold on. Let me let me expand this one here. Yeah. <laughs> uh, full screen. There we are. We've got uh, this is the, at the top. It says sweetheart royalty. And then there it is. 1964, the king and queen. And that looks like Chuck Hagel as the queen, sir. Yeah. <laughs> or the king. Did I say queen? I'm king, king, king. I'm sorry. I, said, I, did, not, I did. It was the total. I, I did not say that on purpose. I'm sorry. Freudian king. Flip. Yeah. Yeah, well, well, TJ, you haven't really changed. You're still a smart <laughs> <laughs> Yes, he is, sir. That was truly unintentional. You can see how red my face is. But <laughs> I, I can tell you one thing. I looked at this picture and I said, uh, your your face says it all. It, it appears to say, get this damn crown off of me as soon as possible. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're going to have, TJ, we're going to have our 60th anniversary Oh sure! Our wow! Royalty, Congratulations! Uh, this year, but it's really our 60th reunion. And uh, Mary Kay Zabawa was the queen, and she's yeah. one of the. She lives in Omaha, by the way, and she's one of the organizers of the reunion. And uh, I suspect most of that, the royalty court will be back for the reunion. But uh, yeah, I I didn't think the 
the crown fit exactly right. So <laughs> got better. well, you look fantastic, sir. Yeah, thank you. All right. Well, that's all I've got for the pictures, gentlemen. That's right. good. Uh, Mr. Good. Secretary. <laughs> <laughs> yeah you get those buried back there tj take those off there. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um yes. first thing i just wanted to say uh, mr secretary it just sounds weird to say like on our podcast we have just you know joe schmo this a news yeah. reporter here and there i feel like i'm in an action movie right now like yeah. mr secretary <laughs> there's an asteroid that's going to collide with planet earth what do we do um, well, you, sh you shoot it down what the hell's wrong with you <laughs> <laughs> come on jeff Come on, Jeff. I should know better. I've seen a ton of Michael Bay movies. Um, in all no. seriousness, though, you have held many different titles, different roles. I mean, you've traveled the world for Pete's sake. You've probably had the opportunity to become a fan of another fan base at some point, just living in different areas. But to my knowledge, you've always stayed a pretty loyal Husker football fan. Um, and with that being said, do you do you have any of your earliest Husker football memories that you can recall or – it more detailed, what's your favorite Husker memory, if you want to nail that down a little bit? Well, you're right, Jeff. I, I have remained a very loyal Nebraska fan, as, as TJ knows. And my son and I come back at least once a year for at least one home game. Mm -hmm. uh, but um, my first memory of a Nebraska football game was when I was a freshman in high school at York, St. Joseph. And... Um, that was in 19, let's see, 1960. And if you go back to Nebraska's record in 1960, Nebraska didn't have very good teams uh, in those days until Bob Devaney got there. And I don't know, in 1960, Nebraska may have won two games, uh, maybe one, but they organized, the school organized a small bus to take us down to a game. And you didn't have any problem with tickets because nobody went to a Nebraska <laughs> game in 1960. And uh, that was the first experience I had with Nebraska football, but I loved it. I mean, even though we weren't winning and I don't, I think, uh, I think we may have played Kansas or Oklahoma state, I think maybe, but we got beat. And, um, uh, but that didn't matter to me. I mean, I just loved the, uh, the whole thing, the big stadium, I mean, the big teams, uh, boy, this was a big deal. Uh, but that was my first experience. Uh, one of the, the, the most uh, fun experiences I had was uh, when we were, uh, it was the first year Callahan was the coach, and we were in the Sun Bowl down in El Paso. Oh. No, 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 we were in the Alamo Bowl. We were in Alamo Bowl uh, down uh, in San Antonio. And uh, against Michigan and Michigan had a pretty good team. And uh, they asked me to, to come down and uh, flip the coin uh, for the awesome. game. Cool. And, and so uh, I took my son Ziller who became a big Nebraska fan. He's, he's still a rabid Nebraska fan. So Ziller was about, I don't know, eight years old. And he went out on the field with me and the refs were out there with me and Ziller and the captains of Michigan, Nebraska teams. And so the ref says to Ziller, my eight year old son, Ziller, why don't you flip the coin? And he didn't wow. bat an eye. He didn't hesitate. He <laughs> said, oh, okay. Okay. So he takes the coin and he throws it up in the air. Uh, wow. And, and uh, he flipped the coin. We have pictures of it, but that was one of the, the memorable moments yeah. in the football with us. And, uh, Zeller's got a big picture of it up in his room. He, he loves it. So I bet. But we, hey. we talk about a core memory there that you that yeah, you unlocked there, you. sir. Yeah, that's it, incredible. And well, we, by the way, and we beat Michigan too. We upset them. Yeah, that was a fun right. one. That was the one that ended with yeah. a, about a million laterals by Michigan until yeah, I think guys yeah. were coming on the field. That was a that was a classic. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. sir, you, you you made it very clear that you are a pretty pretty hardcore. Husker fan do you is it still kind of appointment viewing for you are you are you the type of guy like us to set all things aside for three or four <laughs> hours on a Saturday and plug into the game or is it just kind of you, you watch when you can no no I'm, I'm I'm absolutely committed uh when I get that date and time and that's it and uh nothing else matters love it 
Yeah. Just like just like us, sir. Yeah, yes. That's right. You're just, just one of us. You know, one you're, you're just you're one a fellow common us. fan. You're a fellow common <laughs> <Yeah>. fan. <laughs> what what do you think, sir? What do you think about um, you know, we're, we're through year one of Coach Rule, at least on this podcast. You know, we're drinking a lot of Kool-Aid. we we're sort of expecting <laughs> we're expecting a pretty big jump in year two, or at least a bowl game in year two. Uh, what do you think about the the rule era so far? Uh I think he's the right coach. Um, and I say that not because I'm a rabid fan and every before every game, I got a feeling we're going to win. And you and I, TJ, we go back and forth a couple of days before every game. Email <laughs> back and forth. Uh, no, this is our, we're going to win. We're going to win. But the reason I think he's the right guy, I, I, I watched him this year and you look at his record and what he's done. And it kind of fits. I like his style. I like where, he, where he's focused. One of the first things he said, if you want to play big-time football and you want to win in big-time football, you've got to have the biggest, toughest, smartest, fastest line in the business. Yep. It goes right back to Devaney and, and Osborne. That's the way you win. That's where you start. Yep. And, and then you go from there. I like that, that foundational kind of approach put in this thing, this thing, and it all has to come together. I think he understands all that. And um, I think he will be able to start recruiting some good people. Um, you know, the, the latest in the in the college football and the NIL stuff and, you know, the, the, the other changes that are made where these kids can go to another school, you know, at the end of the season, I've, I'm done with this team i'm going to go to another team uh, i mean that's obviously thrown everything into kind of a, a cocked hat where you can't plan like coaches used to be able to plan uh, but i think he understands that i think he can manage through that uh, i think his temperament is right and i just like everything about him and i think we're going to have a, a pretty good season th this season and i think it's it's not far-fetched to to believe that we can win Six games, seven games. I think that's realistic, and it's even though the Big Ten's not getting any easier. I mean, right, with right. with four tens coming in <clears throat> from the Pac-10, all very good teams. Yeah. Uh, yeah, Big Tens, I think is is as good a conference as there is out there now. I mean, I think the caliber of football we're playing. I mean, we win the national championship. A Big Ten team does. Uh, no, I think it's as is as, as good as as anybody. And I think better than, than all the rest. So rule, rule, I, I think you give rule three years and he, he's going to have a pretty good team. All right. So we'll mark you down for 12 and yep. 0 in 2024. That, that's <laughs> awesome. Going to the playoff. Yep. That's going to be awesome. <laughs> well, sir, you mentioned, you know, going to your first game in 1960 and how you get back to at least one game a year in person. Can you talk a little bit about Memorial stadium and, how special of a place that is and kind of what it means to you? Yeah. Well, like every broadcaster that, that's ever broadcast collegiate football and every broadcaster that's ever been in Memorial Stadium, they, they all say the same thing. There's nothing like it in the country. I mean, Nebraska fans, I mean, everything. And every time I go, I, I get the same feeling. I never get tired of it. I mean, you just it's a thrill. It just – you know, your, your blood runs and, you know, it's just, you, you think you can just zoom anywhere, or zoom to the moon. And I don't mean electronically zooming. I mean, <laughs> out of your seat, but it, right. it just inspires you. It, it fires you up. It's, it's great to see these young people and these young kids out on the field. And it, it's just, it's so inspirational and so good. Um, and it's so American and, just I like everything about it. I just always feel good when I leave uh, after a game. I, I mean, yes, you don't feel good after you lose, but I still feel good. I mean, just getting everybody together in the yeah. tailgate, everybody having fun. And it's one time, I think, uh, uh, out of the year, every one of those games where people can come together, regardless of their politics, regardless of their problems, their differences, you know, you can come together on that Saturday afternoon to support a team and support your state. And, you know, that's a that's a great thing. 
Oh yeah, Absol- absolutely. Oh, it's yeah. I, I've always thought something similar that it just seems to be such a great unifier for yeah. the state of Nebraska. Yeah. Just put everything aside for a few hours on a Saturday, and we're all on the same team. Yeah. Um, is there? Well, I'm. I'm. I was going to say I'm ready to put the pads on, but I think at, <laughs> at, at at 41 years old, I think maybe I'll say I'm just. I'm ready to. I don't tap think the you have any. Yeah. I'm ready yeah. to have eligibility the left, Tage. Yeah. I'm ready to tap the keg at the tailgate. <laughs> Sir, do you uh do you have a, a a favorite Husker game you've ever attended in Memorial Stadium or or a best game that you can remember? Um. Well, they all have been. I mean, every one of them are special in their own way, whether down on the field meeting the opposing coaches uh, or in the locker room or, you know, all those different experiences I've had have, uh, have, have really, every one of them been special. I think uh, always when I was at one of those games, when we played Oklahoma uh, and we beat Oklahoma, I mean, you remember when Osborne took over from Devaney, uh, he had a tough time. I mean, he would win every game and he'd lose to Oklahoma. And that would go on for six or seven years. Uh, and then and then Tom found it. I mean, and he, he found the deal. And then nobody could beat Tom Osborne in Nebraska for for about five years straight. More more than that, actually. But that, that run in the from 90 to 91, 95 that we had with three national championships. But every time we beat Oklahoma, I mean, that was really special. Because I think that to me, that was, you know, beating Oklahoma at Nebraska to see that, that's pretty good. Yeah, 100%. Well, favorite memories are one thing, but uh, if, and I'm sure you have, you've probably, you're a common fan. So I'm sure you've listened to all of our previous podcasts. So Mr. <laughs> Secretary, thank you for listening. Um, you'll know that each one of us probably has some sort of, um, how do I say, hate towards a specific college football team opponent. Is there a team that in your opinion, you just cannot stand that is one of Nebraska's opponents? Oh, God. well, uh, maybe I'm, I'm, I just got jelly in my spine, but uh, you know, not that I would uh, hate, as, as you say. I mean, hate's a strong can't, word. Can't stand politely. Yeah. Uh, I suppose if there was one of those teams, it would be Colorado. And uh, one of the reasons that I say that is because <clears throat> TJ may remember this when Nebraska and Colorado played. Obviously, they'd alternate where they would play at Lincoln or Boulder. And so mm-hmm. when they played in Boulder and I was in the Senate at the time, uh, my wife's sister lives in Denver. She's a teacher in Denver. So we would go out for Thanksgiving. That's when we usually would play, if you recall, uh, after the day after Thanksgiving. And uh, so we'd go out to Denver and, and spend a long weekend with with Claire, Lady uh, sister, and then uh, Art, children Ziller would go out with us and always had a great time and then drive up to Boulder uh, on Friday morning and it would always be cold usually snowing and they would uh, the Colorado maintenance people would go, of course clean everything up except where Nebraska fans would seat would be seated in, the, in the <laughs> inn. and so we'd have to sit there and mm. clear the snow off of the seats off of everything okay everybody else had clean seats except us so you know little things like that do not make that team a favorite uh of yours <laughs> sure. but, but uh, yeah I, don't, I just i never liked their style i always thought they were wise asses i mean no. I, there's just something about them that i just never i mean oklahoma was tough and you, you never liked to lose to oklahoma but I never saw that in Oklahoma. I mean, but right. Colorado is different. And by the way, with their new coach, I don't think that's getting any better. No, <laughs> no. Well, there's uh, there's always been an element of of respect in that Nebraska Oklahoma rivalry yeah. that it hasn't really existed right. with the Colorado one. I was going to say the, the exact same thing. Thirty or forty years, a little different. Yeah. yeah. 
Well, and I know we've lost Colorado a few times in recent years, but let's not forget we own the historical record over them. We 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 beat them up like our little brother, and we're going to beat them again in twenty twenty four. Sir, sir, when you were in the Senate, you had some 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 funny traditions with senators from other states. I, I, I seem to recall, you know, if if we beat you know somebody like a like a Kansas state, you'd deliver like a black armband to, to Senator <laughs> Roberts or the Kansas senators. Do you, can you tell, do you remember what, some of those things or can you tell us about some of those things? Yeah, because uh, everybody knew I was a big Nebraska fan. And of course, before we would play this week before we played, one of the, my colleagues in the Senate state or school, uh, I'd start pushing them a little bit. And, hey, Pat, I mean, are you going to field a team this week or what? <laughs> Uh, you know, I heard, I heard your coach had been indicted, drinking heavily again, and, and you know, <laughs> so we <laughs> kid around a little bit. But yeah, after we beat them, I would have something delivered. I'd have the, I would have black roses sometimes delivered on, on Monday uh, to them, uh, or black armbands. Uh, I would have. I remember once. Uh, I think we played Arizona. Uh, it was on a state, one of our non-conference games, and I had a a, a, a bottle, a, a black bottle of whiskey uh, uh, delivered to McCain's office, and uh, so yeah, I used to do that with with everybody, and uh, that was good because mostly we won. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> there, there maybe wouldn't be as much trash talking these days. No, no, no. right. Uh, the one thing that I noticed, and I think the boys would also agree, is um, Husker fans tend to think that we're we're cursed over just the way things have turned out over the last few years. And after doing some research, we came to the realization that we haven't won a national title. We haven't won a conference championship, let alone a Heisman Trophy winner since you served in the Senate. <laughs> so it begs the question, I mean, do we need to break this curse and kind of try and proposition you to run for Senate again or run for office? Is, are those cards on the table by any chance, Mr. Secretary? Well, well uh, Jeff, why don't we consider this my announcement? Uh, right? <laughs> you heard it here first on the Common yep. Fan Podcast. <laughs> and the three of you will be campaign managers. Perfect. Very good. Absolutely. Love it. Sounds Perfect. great. All right. The co Common Fans bringing you the breaking news as always, listeners. Yeah, well, yeah. I'm the Common Man's candidate. There Absolutely. You go. Perfect. Absolutely. That's a great slogan. Heck yeah. It is. Well, sir, I'm, I'm curious as uh, you know, someone like you, who's, who's both a huge football fan and someone who, who uh, sat in the big chair at the Pentagon. Do you see any correlation between the superiority of the American military and the fact that we play football here and other countries really pretty much don't <laughs> any, any correlation to that? Well, <laughs> I think that's probably a stretch, uh, <laughs> uh, uh, but I would say though, I would see, I do see a correlation uh, in that regard uh, with the spirit of our country, uh, the spirit of our armed forces, the, the, the spirit of our athletics. Uh, there, there's a special, I think, American spirit. And I, that I, I don't think you find in in most countries. I've been to I've been to probably 150 countries in the world, and I'm not an expert on anything, and on certainly on any other country. But there's a very unique spirit Americans have, and I think they bring that to to their athletics, to football, to serving in the military, to, to whatever they do. And I think that's one reason we have led the world in everything. For so many years, um, and I think it's it's a, it's very special, and I think we we should appreciate it uh, rather than continue to divide ourselves and, and 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 not focus on what makes us as Americans uh, so special and and so unique, uh, rather than uh, keep ripping each other apart. Uh, and I would like to take your question further on the political trail, actually, I wouldn't say that, because I don't know, I wouldn't say that America is God's chosen people. I mean, 
you know, we'll all find out someday, but uh, I'm in no hurry uh, for that day. But, uh, but I, I don't think that, I don't think we're superior human beings uh, in that sense. I believe, you you know, we're all God's children, but, but I do think, I do think Americans have a, a special spirit that, that uh, I don't I don't find in other countries, and I think it's like I said in football, it's in the military, it's in everything we do. Yeah, absolutely, awesome, hundred percent. Well, th- thinking about all you've accomplished, sir, and and thinking about thinking back to that kid growing up in North Platte and Ainsworth and Scotts Bluff and Columbus and the different <laughs> places that that you lived. You said what you say seven different towns in Nebraska. Yeah. You know, I, I'd love to hear just a few thoughts on you know what it was like on your first day being sworn in as a U.S. Senator representing Nebraska, the state that meant so much to you and is so much a part of, of who you are and just kind yeah. of, was that kind of surreal or what was that like? Um, well, it, it, it was surreal. I mean, my mother was there uh, when we had our ceremonial swearing in in the old Senate chambers and my brothers uh, and my family and uh, to stand there and represent them and represent the state that I grew up in, uh, that I went to Vietnam from. My brother Tom served with me in Vietnam, as, as you know, TJ. Um, yeah, it was it was special. It, it really was a, uh, one of the most special days in, in my life because it was an honor that I didn't see it so much as a campaign victory. I mean, when I ran in the primary, uh, um, I was supposed to lose. When I ran the general, there was no way I could win, and I won. Um, those were all highlights, of course, of my life and my career for me. But to actually be there in the Senate and realize that you are representing the entire state uh, in the United States Senate was about as special as it gets. Uh, and I've always, I've always carried that feeling with me and always been grateful, very grateful that the state of Nebraska gave me those opportunities, uh, to do that, to serve them. And, um, uh, and as you know, I mean, you worked with me, uh, TJ, uh, I always said, and I said it in the campaigns, I mean, we make, make mistakes, uh, but. We, we want to do the job that all Nebraskans can be proud of, that, that they can have confidence in, but, 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 ha, but be proud of, of our work and be proud of who's representing them. They may disagree, but um, that's secondary. So, yeah, it was a pretty special moment. Wow. Well, I've got a similar question, but, you know, thinking about you going from, from small towns in Nebraska – to the U.S. Senate and then the Pentagon and then, you know, walking onto the Senate floor or walking into the Oval Office to brief the president on something. I mean, you had to have moments where you just kind of stop for a moment and think about how far you'd come from those little towns in Nebraska. Um, you have any lessons that you kind of carried with you from growing up in Nebraska that that uh, kind of helped you out in all those different positions and all those different uh, places that your career took you? Well, Matt, I can tell you that every time I would walk on the Senate floor, every time I would walk in the White House, I was just at the White House uh, meeting with the president right before Christmas. Uh, it, it, you just get a special feeling. I never, ever lost that feeling. And I still don't. I've been in the White House many, many times before I was, after I left the Senate, before I was Secretary of Defense, I was chairman of the president's intelligence advisory board. And uh, I had an office across the street. I had <clears throat> the same IDs to get me into the White House. I parked at the White House, so on and so on. But I don't know how many times I've been in the White House, all over the White House, all the office, residents, so on and so on. It, it doesn't make any difference. Every time you walk in that place or on the Senate floor in the Capitol, you just get a feeling that's just overwhelming. And I do think, and I do think about all those little towns that I lived in, Rushville, and Ainsworth especially, I mean, really little towns, uh, you know, and here I am in the White House or in the Senate. And it's not it's not an ego thing. It's just a, how grateful I am to have that experience. But 
but it's just it's just something special and um i think i think others have that feeling and i always thought if you if you ever get to the point where you walk into the, onto the senate floor or into the white house and you don't have that feeling get out get out mm -hmm. and uh but i never ever quit having it i i just uh it was always there i thought two terms when i first first ran i said this when I was running the first time and I interview after I, I won that 12 years was enough. I thought, um, uh, I think you need uh, fresh energy and new ideas. Uh, I'm not for term limits for the, the Congress or the Senate. I mean, we have term limits for a president and I think that's right. Um, uh, <clears throat> but for me, 12 years is, is, was enough and let somebody else do it. I had a great run in 12 years, and um, but I've always believed that you need fresh churn, you, new ideas. Uh, you still need some of the old, older people there too. You still need the veterans who've been around three or four terms. I mean, so you need a balance uh, of that. But uh, but uh, but uh, to your question, uh, I never have ever lost. I, I get up to the Senate uh, too on different issues and senators see senators and congressmen and go to the congress and walk in i'm i'm uh, on the board of the u.s capitol uh society and uh i love that because one of the things i help them with is at night i'll do special tours uh uh for people and their donors and others who have been helpful to capitol hill society and i uh that's a lot of fun for me and that's a way that i kind of keep involved and, and keep uh keep active with with the congress and i love that awesome that's great and i'm glad you said that mr secretary because um speaking of retiring uh, i'm a retirement educator that's my my role my job and so when people retire i usually work with like teachers and maybe they retire and then a few years later they decide maybe I'm, I, I still want to work i'll come back and be a substitute teacher you retired from the senate and then had to come back and fill a role as the Secretary of Defense. Um, <laughs> what was it like retiring, thinking you, like you said, you had a good run, you, you, yeah. you had a really good run, and then having to come back, and not having to come back, choosing to come back, and having literally the world's largest nuclear military arsenal at your fingertips. That's got to be pretty daunting, to say the least. So I just want to get your thoughts on that. What was that like? Well, yes, it was daunting. I, I though, had an advantage of the, what I said earlier, that I had been chairman of the President's Intelligence Advisory Board. Okay. That's not a full-time job. I, when uh, when I left the Senate, that was the same year that the President, President Obama was elected. Uh, and I left in 2009. Uh, and he offered me a number of, of jobs, big, big-time jobs. And I turned them all down. And I said, wow. no, I'm done with government for a while. Uh, and, but, but the chairmanship of the intelligence advisory board did fit because it wasn't a paying job. I had offices and staff across the street in the white house. Uh, it, it kept me in the deal enough. It was a, it was a big job. It, we, I saw all the same intelligence that he did and I'd go over and brief him, uh, on intelligence matters. I'd get to the CIA and get to the Pentagon and saw it, which was a perfect job because it wasn't a full-time job. I taught at Georgetown University also, and then I was on different boards and did different things. So it was perfect for me. And this is kind of funny, but it's exactly what happened. I was in Paris, of all terrible places to be, uh, <laughs> in the fall of, uh, of uh, 2012, or after the election. I was there uh, for a board meeting for a company that was, a uh, New York company that was on the board of, and we were having a, a three-day meeting in Paris. And so I wanted to slip away from the, from the group. They were going to some fancy dinner, and I didn't want to do that. What I wanted to do was I wanted to go find a nice little French bistro, a quiet little bistro, have some nice French wine, and sit at, and look out the window at the Eiffel Tower. That's what I wanted to do all by myself. So I finally did. I went and briefed the, the French intelligence advisor to the French president. And then I went over to this little restaurant. 
So I'm sitting there in a restaurant and my cell phone rings. I pick it up. And on the other line is this lady she says, is this Chuck Hagel? I said, yes. She said, this is the White House. The president would like to talk to you. I said, OK, uh, hang on a minute. So all these French waiters were around and none of them spoke English. And so I tried to explain to them I have to go out and take a call. I guess I wasn't going to talk to the president in, 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 in a restaurant. Where people could listen, so I'm trying to explain. I'm not going to run out on my bill. I, I'm just, I just need to go outside. So I left the credit card. I mean, I left the manager came over. Oh, it was a huge thing. So they finally <laughs> let me go outside. So I, I, they were waiting for me, and finally the president comes on and, and he says, "Chuck," he says, "Where are you?" I said, "Well, Mr. President, I'm in Paris." He said, "Paris." What the hell is a country boy like you doing in Paris? <laughs> <laughs> oh, Beautiful. Uh, that's that's when he said, uh, I want you to be my secretary of defense. I was shocked because I, I had never uh, I had never thought about any of those jobs. I was offered a lot of them before, but I wasn't I wasn't trying to get a new job. I mean, I was very happy with everything I, I was doing. And I said, uh, okay. He said, when are you coming back? And I said, I'll be back here in a couple of days. He said, come see me next week if you can. I said, okay. So that's how, all it's, how it all started. But, but uh, uh, Jeff, to your question, um, yeah, it, it was different. I mean, uh, I had been deputy secretary uh, at the Veterans Affairs uh, Administration in the Reagan administration. So, you know, I had some idea of what, we, what you're going to go through, but I mean, it was a whole different time between the Reagan administration and where yeah. we, we are now. Uh, but yeah, when I walked into the Pentagon that morning and took the oath of office, yeah, yeah it was a big deal. I, yeah. I, I, I kind of drank it all in and, but you know, you just, it's kind of like going on to a football field or it's like, going back to who you are um mm -hmm. you're chuck hagel um just happened to be a senator or you just happen to be secretary of defense or just happen to be an army sergeant uh, right. i mean you're you're still chuck hagel so you just focus on who you are and what you believe and your own self-confidence and don't be afraid of it don't be intimidated uh just take it on no big deal just take on that's what i i tried to do uh, you know, when I first day I was there and it's intimidating as hell, but yeah. I spent the day going around talking with all the everybody there. I didn't, didn't get to my office until later that afternoon, but to the, the senior people, junior people and the and the people who were way, way down. I went into the, uh, you know, went into places where there are nothing but low enlisted men and women. And that's the first time a secretary had ever gone into those those offices. Oh my God, the Secretary of Defense is here. But I wanted to, I wanted to send a message the first day. You know, Hegel's going to be the common man's secretary. I mean, really, that's what I believed. Yeah, there you so, go. Yeah, and uh, anyway, it was, it was, it was dawning. But you can't let that uh, overwhelm you. Right. I could, I could totally imagine you telling that waiter or waitress, um, I can't pay my bill. It's a, it's a matter of national security. <laughs> I'm on with yeah. the president. I'm really yeah. on with the president. <laughs> uh, yeah, sir, sir, I'm, I'm, I'm glad you brought up that last part because it actually leads uh, to the next question I wanted to ask. But, you know, I think we'd be remiss if we didn't, didn't ask you about some, some lessons in leadership from someone who's done it at the highest levels and. <clears throat> You know, that that story that you just told about what you did on your first day at the Pentagon is not unique. So I remember hearing when you were in the Senate and you'd go to a foreign military base with Senate colleagues and, you know, everybody was clamoring for the meeting with the senior senior officers. You know, well, where's Hagel? He's over talking to the junior, you know, the enlisted folks trying to get the straight story of what's really going on or trying to understand how, what their experience is like. Um, you did, I know you did that as secretary as well. Um, you've got a book, uh, a chapter of your book, um, which is still relevant. All common fan, all common fans should check it out. America, our next chapter by, or by Chuck Hagel. Um, but you've got a chapter of your book, who speaks up for the rifleman, 
Now, now that context of war, of course, is the most serious context. But I think there's a lesson there that that can be translated to any organization, you know, a football team, a classroom, a business, you know, a leader can't get too far away from from all the people in the organization, even the folks who are maybe more junior or the folks at the bottom, so to speak. Can you talk about sort of that approach of yours and, and why you've always believed that's so important? Yes, uh, uh, thank you. Well, I don't think there's any question, TJ, that uh, uh, that feeling, that premise, uh, that guiding principle for me uh, came from and, 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 and shaped me by the experiences I had in those little towns I lived in, uh, in the different towns. When you have to go into a new school in the middle of a school year and know no one and uh, all those experiences really helped me that way understand that everyone is important. I used to tell our, our military all the time, and uh, it, it's not, not profound or unique, but uh, you're only as strong as your weakest link. And you better understand that in everything, by the way, in business, everything, football teams. Uh, but in the military, that, that has really got to be addressed. And so everybody's important. Everybody's a human being. Everybody's got feelings. Uh, yeah, they've got different responsibilities. Um, and I get that. But you, you treat everybody with respect. And I think that's where you have to start. And if you do that, I, I think that's the only way you can build a team, a, a, an effective, confident team that everybody has got a role. And, um, and you have to acknowledge that. The leader has to acknowledge that. And you do it in different ways. And some of the ways you do it is like what I, I did. Uh, but I always put myself in that position as, as the kind of the low guy in the totem pole. I went to basic training, just, to, just like any other enlisted guy who was screamed at and you know, how dumb are you? And get over here, you dumbass, and so on. I mean, the whole deal. I, you know, and I saw all that because I've always kind of worked from the bottom. And, and we, we had a pretty tough upbringing. Uh, and it's, it's why we moved so much. And, uh, and my dad died when I was in high school. And so, I mean, a lot of people had a lot tougher than I've had it. But Fortunately, we had a, a wonderful mother, uh, you know, who brought all four of my brothers along. And then my youngest brother was killed in a car accident. And so we've had some some tragedies, I think, that shaped me as well uh, to appreciate everyone. But I mean, I think those are some of the things, the principles and the guiding dynamics, TJ, that uh, kind of helped me through this. And I found strength in it, too. Uh, uh, working with all the people. I, I always found strength in that. I always found great heroism with people who, who were at, at the bottom, maybe, maybe logistically in certain things, but not at the bottom as a human being. And, and there's no bottom, everybody's equal. But those were things that helped me. That's, that's fantastic. Awesome. Well, you've been you've been more than generous with your time, sir. I'd love to ask you one more question. If you don't want to answer it, you don't have to, and we can always edit it out, at, you know, and just take it out completely. But <laughs> um, I don't think this is something I've ever asked you. But you know, you kind of um, you know, publicly a little bit, I guess, uh, at least flirted with the idea of running for president, kind of late two thousand six, early two thousand seven. I'm curious, how close did you come to running for president? Well, I took a look, a serious look at it, as you know. I was invited up to New Hampshire and different places. But at that time, TJ, uh, I was really crosswise with my party, the Republican Party, because of Iraq. And I was very critical uh, of Iraq. I said we should have never gone into Iraq. It was a huge mistake. We went into Iraq based on lies. And now all that's come out. And everything I said then is, is, is true. I mean, it, it, it's not political. But at the time, it was, a, it was tough. I was, I was uh, 
separated literally from my party, from my president, Republican George Bush. Uh, and as you know, I was I was pretty tough on that issue. And um, I had seen, I'd been in one of those wars before where it got started because of lies. And I saw the human tragedy of that. Uh, 58,000 dead on the Vietnam Memorial, the year, year my brother Tom and I were in Vietnam in 2008, or, or uh, 19, um, 68, uh, we sent home over 16,000 dead Americans in one year. So I saw all that happening again in Iraq and based on the lies that were perpetrated and, and how so many Republicans just fell in line to support the president. And I, I didn't do that. And I was really on the outside. So the more I looked at this, the more I got into it, uh, TJ, it, you know, it just wasn't the time for me uh, to run for president. I couldn't have gotten the nomination because I was so, so apart from my own, uh, my own party. It's interesting later on, uh, about a year later, as, <clears throat> as things started to change, I mean, uh, maybe I was a year ahead uh, myself uh, with events or something, but, but I made the right decision. And uh, so. Well, you've had a unbelievably impressive and, and fantastic career. Um, we'd like to end, sir. Uh, so when we do, as, as you know, from pro probably from listening, when we do our, <laughs> our uh, anytime we do our post-game recaps, we do a, a recap of every game. So we're, when we're in the season, we do a game recap. And uh, Matt, Jeff, and I each award uh, a corn cob to, we pick one player, <laughs> one player to receive, we, one player each to receive a corn cob um, for superior. Not like a game ball. For, for, yeah, it's like yeah. a game ball. Yeah. It's, yeah. Our, it's a, for, for superior performance uh, on the football field. And so uh, you, uh, we would like to uh, award, you're the first ever, recipient of um an honorary corn cob um and i'm gonna go ahead and read this to you let me full screen here and we're gonna send you a hard copy of this too we're gonna you know this is i know you've received <laughs> excuse me you've received a number of awards and honorary degrees so this can go up on the wall next to those um, yep. but it says uh, honorary corn cob this corn cob is proudly presented to charles t hegel <coughs> excuse me former secretary of defense former U.S. Senator, proud common fan, <clears throat> in recognition of your dedicated service to the nation over many decades, as well as your lifelong devotion to the Nebraska Cornhuskers, we present you this honorary corn cob through the power vested in us by all <laughs> common fans. <laughs> <laughs> Beautiful. Uh, well, I, I'm speechless, really, totally <laughs> speechless. I, <laughs> that doesn't happen often to me. But uh, what a high honor, uh, and it, uh, it will find a, a place of honor on the wall, right, right next to the president's picking me as Secretary of Defense <laughs> and, my, and my, my Senate uh, official status. Uh, it's, it's kind of uh, the, the same kind of honor I used to get from my colleagues when I would show up at Halloween <laughs> with a John McCain mask or a Colin Powell mask or a Pat Roberts mask. It's, a, it's the same kind of distinction. Uh, high honor indeed to the three of you. I'm grateful. This has been fun. Thank you for what you're doing. I think you're, you're doing something very good for the state and in the country and Cornhusker fans everywhere. So much continued success. See you at oh, the thank you. Yes, yes, thank, thank you. Thank you, well, sir. Thank Thank, thank you, sir. <clears throat> thank you so much for joining us. It's truly, truly been an honor and a really fun conversations. Um, make sure to check it out uh, both on your podcast, a platform of choice, common fans, as well as on YouTube. You don't want to miss some of these fun pictures and graphics. Thanks for listening. As always, common fans, GBR for life. <laughs> Thank mm -hmm. you.